Um, okay. So today, um, title of my slide or title of my session is "Managing Complex Projects with Design Components." Um, I'm John Albin, uh, John Albin Wilkins, uh, better known as John Albin, basically everywhere, Drupal.org, Twitter, that sort of places. Um, I'm the senior front end developer for Previous Next, um, and uh, I'm really excited about giving this talk. Um, I've actually been iterating on this talk for more than a year. Uh, the very sort of the prototype version of this talk was given at SASConf last year. Um, and I've given it three or four or five times now, something like that. Um, and it keeps getting better and better. And like, if you saw the video in Austin, it's way better than that. Um, it, I have been doing uh, Drupal for 10 years now. My 10 year anniversary was like last month. And more importantly though, I've been doing front end development for the past 21 years. Um, and because I've been around so long, I've done a lot of stuff, but it's, it's just because I've been around for so long. Um, Zen Grids, Normalize, Succinct, all this stuff. That I'll post these slides, you'll be able to get the URLs later. Um, but I, I'm, one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk about this topic today um, is because of what I've learned just in the past month. Um, and I'm gonna have to give a little trigger alert here. Um, this session will mention the word agile. Um, it, the, I'm not knocking trigger loads here. I, this was my trigger word for a while. Um, people kept talking about agile and not explaining it very well. And then they're like, oh, you'll, you'll figure it out as you do it. And you know, kept doing it, you know, the agile or agile-like process. And like doing it does not make it any more clear. Okay. Um, I, I got way more confused when I was actually doing it than before, because uh, yeah. Just bad. Um, but I have, uh, my goal for today is basically to explain Agile in a way that I would have understood it two years ago. That's my goal for today. Um, how many people here went to David and Brian's state of the front end session yesterday? A fair few of you, yeah, okay. So, you know, they, their question was basically, look, look at all these different technologies, you know, what's going on? Can we know all this stuff? Um, and I saw the first version of their session at DrupalCon Austin, and I've been thinking about this question in front end development um, very strongly for the past, you know, several months now. You know, where are we headed? Um, and there's a, there's a great quote here by Nicholas Gallagher um, that says, uh, are you new to front end development? Here's a secret, no one else really knows what they're doing either. <laughs> um, and it's totally true. It's, it's it's very overwhelming, especially when you're new. But even when you've been around for a long time, um, the um, this quote is from January uh, 2013. Uh, so it's been a little bit. And I, hopefully he's I, I'm he's a he's a smart person. I'm sure that he's figured out some um, basically what he's doing. Um, and uh, so rephrasing the question: What the hell is going on? Um, the problem that most people, including myself, have been having is we have all these new technologies, right? So many new technologies. This is a technology conference, so we're talking about technologies all the time. But of course, process is another very important part of the picture. And one of the interesting things about responsive design was that it was a process, a way of building websites that came with associated technologies. And that process, together with the technologies, made much more sense of media queries and you know, scalable images. All of those things made much more, more sense once you brought them into the process of, of responsive design. So when I gave this talk previously, I, I talked about web components. Because again, I was thinking about technology. Um, web components are a new HTML uh, spec that um, you can do some of this using JavaScript right now, um, some, some JavaScript polyfills right now. Um, but this is future technology that you can't quite use on real websites yet. Um, and that's just, I was too focused on that one thing in Austin to really get the bigger picture. Um, and there's all these other things going on, right? There's Twig, Jenkins, 
CSS, JSS, linting, Yeoman, Bower, just crazy, crazy, crazy. And this is only like 5% of the stuff, right? There's so much more. There's like 20 times more different technologies, right? Um, ugh, this is bad. Let me skip to the next slide. Skip. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I've started to notice is a lot of those technologies have to do with component libraries and continuous integration. Um, those of you who don't know what continuous integration or don't quite get it, it's basically it's, it's automation um, plus regression testing. So you're trying to be able to uh, you know, build your site um, using automation and also do regression testing so that basically when you add new things to it, you, know, you can ensure that you're not making your site explode in some other area that you're not focused on at that point. Um, and continuous integration is, is, is basically, the reason why people talk about it is because agile development requires continuous integration. If you are you know, supposedly doing agile development and you're not doing continuous integration, you, you're doing it wrong, basically. I mean, it's impossible to actually do agile without continuous integration. As much as you try, you will fail until you start doing continuous integration. Um, and then sort of the, some of the other key technologies that I've seen they're, they're talking about component libraries, right? Um, and a great way to like, document a component library is um, with style guides, right? Um, so this is, these are the two topics that I'm going to be talking about mostly, the this rest of the session. And um, I, I want to explain Agile development so that we can all sort of understand it because I never figured out what was going on. And of course, I need to actually show you, of course, what's wrong with waterfall development, right? So this is a typical waterfall um, plan here. You, you plan it first, and then you do the design phase, um, then you do some development, and then you do the theming, right? Um, this, is, this is the way that you plan it from start to deadline. Um, but what often happens, and I say usually, yeah, usually happens, uh, is basically, you get to a certain spot, like on, say you're here, say it's today, and you realize that you don't have enough time to actually finish the theming. So the way that you solve your problem is that you basically, you stop, you don't do half the theming, right? You throw that away. And oftentimes that means that you, you're you also throwing away development time because you're not theming those, th those features. You're throwing away all these designs and you're throwing away all these planning. Now, if you look at the actual time where you've done useful work, it's, it's about half of the actual start to deadline time is usable and the rest of it you've thrown away. This is horrible. I mean, basically you could have done the same thing in half the time and half the budget, right? But because Waterfall does all of this upfront planning, um, it, it's, it's just really bad. So, so Agile Development looks at that and it's, what is the core concept? What is it trying to do to make things better? And the number one thing here is reducing your risk, right? Um, in the waterfall, we had the risk of like, well, what if we don't finish everything that we planned, right? You, you're, you have a huge risk because um, you end up with a lot of wasted time if you don't get to the end of the plan. Um, and so agile development, reducing your risk by controlling and minimizing the risk at every stage of the process. So let's look at an agile project. Um, again, you have start deadline. This is the same time frame as before, but now you've broken up your project from start to finish in two week sprints. Um, and then you've taken your feature list and you've broken it basically into a whole bunch of features um, and you go through the client and say, what are your top priorities? Make sure that this list is in the priority order of what you feel is the most important stuff because we're going to start at the top and grab the first couple features and implement it during the first sprint. Okay? And then when the second sprint comes along, what do you think happens? Do we just sort of start going and keep going and then finally at the end we're like, hey, here client, what do you, we're done, right? No, actually, when we get to the second sprint, we have to talk to the client again and say, okay, maybe something's changed. Actually, almost guaranteed that something has changed in their priorities because they've now seen the results of your first sprint. So you want them to look at the priority list again, reprioritize it again, make sure they understand the stuff that they're deprioritizing and understand the stuff they get they're prioritizing. And just grab the next set of features do it in the next sprint. 
and do that continuously over and over again. And when you get to the end there, the client is well aware of the stuff that you haven't finished because they specifically deprioritized it. And by definition, the stuff that you've finished by the deadline is the most important stuff that the client wanted. Every two weeks, prioritize project goals, complete a set of features, and you're creating a releasable product. Um, and uh, so what does that mean for the web? How do we actually do, like, people have, a, I have a really hard time understanding, like, okay, when I get to that first sprint, what do I have after two weeks on a website? Realistic, what does that mean? Um, I, I did some scrum training recently, and uh, the, the best advice that my trainer gave me is basically, it's going to take you two or three years of doing this before you figure out sort of the mechanics of how to do it the best way. Um, and the answer is I don't quite, I'm, I've, I'm having some vague ideas of what that first feature is going to look like, that first set, or so to say, what that first deliverable at the end of the sprint looks like. It's going to be really minimal, right? A single one page website uh, is deliverable. It's complete. All of its features have been designed. Um, that's what sort of the minimal viable product look like at the end of that first sprint. And it's going to be hard for us to figure that out. But the mechanics of Agile and, and the web basically mean that we can, we can do this. Oh, actually, I should say. So, so Kim Pepper, my boss, um, he asked me, um, how do we get designers and front-end developers integrated into our Agile workflow? Um, he asked me that right when I got uh, started working there in, in May. And, and I said, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I have really no idea. But, but then he, s he sent me to a scrum training um, last month, and it just blew my mind. And I, it was two days intensive course. And I came out of there, and I said, OK, I know exactly what, what we need to do. And it's not even that hard. That's, what, that's why it was so hard to figure out, was because it's really, really simple. All we need is component-based design plus automated style guides. Um, and if I had known this when I submitted this session, I, I would have called this session Style Guide Driven Development, the new web development. I honestly believe that, um, I know probably a lot of your bosses are like, well, we sh we're going to try and do Agile. Right? You will all be doing Agile 10 years from now. Guarantee it. I feel like Style Guide Driven Development, that's the way you're, we're going to be implementing websites. It's not just a front-end developer thing. This is, this is how web development is going to work. So style guide driven development, the only requirements are component-based design, automated style guides. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give a live demo of the automated style guides. Um, and then I'm also going to be talking about what do I mean by component-based design. So we'll go through both of those topics. Um, and let's get started with the component-based design. Uh, you know, what are we doing now? that we're doing wrong, right? So CSS specificity wars. Th this is something that we're definitely doing wrong. Um, yeah, I have to get the cat vid uh, gif in there. Um, whoops, I missed one slide that wasn't converted from Austin's theme. Anyway, um, so you've probably seen some rule sets just like this inside your Drupal theme, menu, item, a link, um, and then uh, you, you, so you've styled like your nav bar, um, and then you're like, oh, the sidebar has a different styling, oh, it's got all the same classes, okay, I'll just, I'll add a new rule set that's sidebar menu, and this is like your side navigation as you drill down, um, and then for whatever reason, like the client says, oh, I need it on this, on this one page, I need to have like this style look different, um, so you just start getting these crazy and crazy more, higher and higher specificity on all these rule sets. Um, and uh, when I first started using SAS, I was like, oh, I can fix this problem. I'll just rewrite it in SAS. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, the problem here is that all I've done is I've, I'm now auto-generating the same crappy CSS I had before. <laughs> um, I love SAS, but this doesn't, it doesn't fix this problem. Um, the other problem we have is uh, overly generic class names. Um, this is especially true in, in Drupal. Um, you have a title. Um, there's also titles inside blocks, inside nodes, inside views. Um, basically, this means that you can't actually style anything with a just the title. 
because it bleeds across all these other different things that have completely different styles. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that that this is in D7 because of me. I'm, you know, sorry about that. <laughs> um, content, same thing. Black node use. This one wasn't me, thank God. Um, <laughs> this this is bad, but you know. It, you learn from your snakes, uh, learn from your mistakes, and and move on. Um, you know, it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> so, so given the mistakes that we're doing now, um, how do we fix that, right? And that's with design components. So when I say design components, um, basically what I'm talking about is is the object in object-oriented CSS, uh, the module in uh, SMACs, which is scalable, modular, what the hell is it? Yeah, whatever that it stands for. Um, block in uh, BEMS, block element modifier, UI pattern. These are all the same thing, same concepts. Um, and and uh, you know, Bootstrap and, and Foundation, those are also component libraries. This is the same idea. It's just a library of components. Um, and even the, the, the upcoming web component spec, um, that's, you know, components um, built using HTML markup. Um, like, it's, like, yeah. I, I think that Preston So is giving a presentation where he's talking about some new CSS and HTML stuff. He, he should talk about, he'll probably talk about web components there as well. It's the next session after this, yeah. So go see that. He'll, he'll go over the more specifics of web components. Um, so these are all the same concepts. Um, and, and basically, um, the, our goals of, of CSS components is we're, um, they're applying to a loose set of HTML elements. They're repeatable. So if you apply a design component to a particular set of HTML elements and apply it to a different one, you'll get the exact same design. They're specific, meaning that um, the same name isn't going to bleed over to other designs. It's just going to be that one design using that one class. They're self-contained, yet the styles don't bleed over the thing, and, and nestable. So you can have um, one component sort of nested inside another one. Um, I'll go over this list again um, because I want to give you a bit more concrete examples. Um, here's the uh, PRI website. Um, this is one of the first websites that I helped build um, using this, this idea of, of design components. Um, and I took this sort of lead article here and, and made a single design component out of it. It had you know, an, an image to the left, um, certain styling for the title, um, the taxonomy uh, date, um, additional taxonomy in the top left there, um, and, and that also that uh, red uh, share count there. So that was, that was one of the first ones that I implemented. Um, I, I tried to make that repeatable. Um, and then I went on to the next feature and, and found something else to you know, identify as a, a single design that can be repeated. Um, and sort of scroll down here. Um, and, and then down here at the very bottom, you can see here's another list of, of news articles. Um, very similar, um, but uh, the order of the stuff is different. Um, the share count is on the left instead of the right. Um, so what I ended up doing is, is I made the share count I refactored, made the share count its own uh, design component, and then sort of nested it inside them. So um, as I looked at the designs, I would discover the reusability as I went. Um, now, there's a lot of different things going on here inside this design, right? Just inside that one component. Um, how do you actually, like, Identify all those parts. How do you write it? How do you organize that component? Um, and the way that I, that I start out is, is by looking at SMACs. SMACs is a way of categorizing CSS. You have base, layout, module, state, theme. <laughs> it, it's like Jonathan Snooks hates Drupal developers. He has to use the exact same terminology that Drupal does. Um, so I, I usually, actually, instead of that, uh, um, I will use base, layout, components, state, and skin. So I've replaced module with components and theme with skin. Um, this makes it much easier to talk to other Drupal developers. Um, so for the rest of the slides, I, I won't be using the official SMACs names, but these other ones here. Um, so 
when I started looking at this and started figuring out how am I going to use this categorization to build design components, I realized that, that state and skin, they're not actually equal levels of components, layouts, and base. The state and skin are actually parts of the component. If you're building a component, state and skin are, are pieces of them. They're, um, and, and in fact, there was something missing too, which was BEM. Um, the additional things that you need to understand a component is you know, the sort of the base component, different elements, there's modifiers, states, and skins. Um, I could go back to the PRA example and start to like point at things like this is an element and, and this is a skin and this is a state and it, it would be very difficult to understand so instead I'm gonna use an analogy. Um, and one of my, my favorite quotes about explaining technology through analogy is, uh, is this one. You see, radio is a kind of very, very long cat. You pull his tail in New York and his head is meowing in Los Angeles. Do you understand? You, you, you send signals. They receive them there. The only difference is there is no cat. <laughs> Albert Einstein. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to claim that my analogy is as awesome as this one or as simple, um, but we're going to talk about design components using uh, the analogy of a flower. Um, a, a very poorly drawn flower because I've done it myself, um, but this is going to be the, the visual analogy for understanding the parts of a design component. So uh, this is our, our base class, uh, CSS class, uh, just dot flower. This is going to go on you know, one of the HTML elements. Um, and then we, when we start looking at elements, we're basically talking about different pieces of that design component. In this case, flower petals. Um, and, we're, and we're using BEM syntax here um, for building our classes. The important thing is to understand that, that you know, petals is a, a element of the flower component. And you do that by having very specific naming um, so so in, instead of having high CSS specificity, we're, we're converting uh, that CSS specificity into very specific naming conventions, right? So it's low CSS specificity, specificity, but a very specific name so that it doesn't bleed across to other things. Um, it, in addition to the, the petals one, we also have you know, the face, uh, we have the stem, and we have the leaves. Um, and, and just so you understand that when I, when I said it's, this is a loose collection of HTML elements, I, I really meant that because you can also have a flower bed, right? Um, and obviously the, the flower bed is a wrapper around the flower itself. So it's going to be a wrapping HTML element. So it's totally fine to have a part, an element of your component be outside the DOM of the base component. That's totally fine. Um, let's go on to modifier here. So we can have a modifier called tulip, and this converts um, our normal flower um, into a, a tulip looking one just by using a slightly different CSS class. So flower dash dash tulip, um, the double dash here designates that you are using a modifier um, to, to make a variant of our normal design component. Um, and, and now, just given this naming convention, I, I see a lot of people take that and sort of start running with it, and you really don't want to make this complicated. I, I, I was actually shown this example today. Um, channel dash tab underscore underscore guide underscore underscore upcoming dash video underscore underscore info underscore underscore time. Woo! Um, <laughs> there's actually only two problems with this. Um, you, you shouldn't be inferring HTML structure with your class names. It's really no need, right? Because it, it also makes it impossible to refactor and simplify. Okay, you totally need to simplify your HTML if I'm guessing correctly here. Um, you simplify the HTML. You don't have to rename your class names just because you've simplified the HTML. So it, this is just completely unnecessary. You have a component and you have an element. Just make your element sort of descriptor longer the, rather than start nesting it crazy like this. Um, and the, the second problem with this is semantics. Um, semantic namings. Uh, content semantics 
they're handleable by HTML5. So whether you have an article, you have a menu, um, that's already handled by HTML5 elements. There's no need to try and describe your content using CSS classes. You know, Drupal uses sort of basically build semantics for all of its CSS class names. It's like, oh, the views module makes this, so I'll name all my classes views. So it uses build semantics. It's not the best, um, but that's what we have right now. Um, but there's really no need. Um, you know, let's make our class names based on design semantics. You're trying to describe the design in a way that you understand it's meaningful to developers and de designers so that they understand what that class name means um, and what design is trying to describe so that it can be repeatable. But don't, you know, don't make it too specific, like green box, and then later you need to rename, you know, you need to refactor it and make it purple, right? But just, just try and come up with a relatively good name that's based on design semantics. And also do not, you know, just kill yourself trying to come up with a naming. Don't worry about it. I mean, it's really not that important. Name it something that seems to make sense. Just, I mean, spend no more than like 30 seconds thinking about this name. Really, just just do it because you, there's there's no need to get crazy. You, if you come back the next day and you're like, oh, God, why did I name it that? Just refactor it, you know, or just, you know, admit, admit your shame to the rest of the team and, and move on. It's just all right. Um, oh, so, so getting back to our design component, if you go into state, um, this is a hover state, right? So uh, we, we, in this case, is a, you know, mouse is hovering over it. Um, the state is actually, there's a couple of different ways that you can have state. Um, this is a, um, a mouse state. Um, you can also have um, a JavaScript state. So like some JavaScript sort of applies um, this extra is pollinating class to your component. Um, and uh, of course, in MIDI queries, there are also a state of your design component. So this is the desktop version of our flower. Um, you can see it's just wrapped in a MIDI query, right? Um, and, 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 and of course, you know, print styles. Print styles are also, you know, they're just MIDI queries, right? So here's our print style. Um, and then if you move on to skin, skin is kind of a weird one. Um, and for a long time, I didn't have a good example of what this actually was because it basically skin got started in with like Yahoo in the, in the 90s. I don't know if you remember this. You would go to the Yahoo website and then it would be like all yellow and stuff. And then you would go to like Yahoo Finance and it would be the exact same layout and all the same boxes, but now they'd be in green, right? So it was a, it was a, what skin is basically, it's a, it's a global, it's a global modifier, right? So it's, you're modifying this design component, but you're sort of applying one class at like maybe the body tag, and it affects all of your design components across the board on your entire site, right? So skin is basically a special case modifier that's applied globally. Um, and in our example, we're gonna have an is night uh, flower here. So this is what it looks like when it's night. Uh, yeah, global modifier. And, and, and that's basically it. I mean, that's, those are the, it's relatively simple rules. You can learn this stuff and, and memorize it um, and just use those rules as you're building your design components, identifying the repeatable bits. Use these rules um, to do your naming conventions. Here's an, you know, all the selectors here again. So uh, the dash component, um, we use a single dash if we need to have multiple words to describe our components because sometimes you just can't come up with a single word. Um, Double dash uh, specifies that it is a you know a modifier. You're very making a variation of the design, so you're like tweaking it just a little bit, so that when you apply that class, you're getting the slightly altered one. All of your elements are with double underscores. Um, sometimes a, a a variant will have a slightly different styling on that same element. And then all of your different states: uh, JavaScript state, hover states, MIDI queries. Um, and then lastly, the, the global modifier as a skin, right? Now, I'm fine if you hate double underscores and double dashes and dashes and stuff like that and use some other way to identify which bits are the component and which bits are the modifier. That's totally cool. But these same ideas apply even if you use completely different, you know, syntaxy bits in between them. 
Um, so, so let's go over this list again one more, one more time. So CSS is design components. They're applied to a loose collection of HTML elements. Again, we're not trying to infer any specific HTML DOM structure. They're completely repeatable. They're very specific, self-contained, and nestable. Um, and, and this naming structure has been adopted by Drupal 8. Um, Drupal 8's uh, you know, official class naming convention is, uh, ah, dang it, oh, there we go. Um, is described here, uh, drupal.org slash node 188.6.7.7.0. Um, and it follows these exact same naming conventions. So when I start actually building a website using design components, um, my file organization is basically the thir first three levels of Smacks. So I'll have a base folder, um, a layout folder, a components folder, um, and then everything just sort of goes into the, one of those three folders here. Um, and and the, the, the SAS setup, because I love SAS, um, is basically this. So uh, my styles.scss file is going to import the init partial. Um, and the initialization partial is basically in charge of loading any third party libraries that I need. Um, it's in charge of loading the variables as well. And that's where I store all of my SAS variables. Um, and that way, if I have multiple uh, .scss files that I need to generate, like a wysiwyg.scss file, um, it could also import the init and get the exact same access to the same variables and the same SAS libraries. Um, and then, um, oh yeah. So here's my styles.scss. So uh, we import the init, um, import the base, import all the layouts. Um, and then all the components. And uh, this, this ends up with a really simple folder structure. Um, and, but it also means that um, because every single one of my design components are in a separate file, uh, you end up with a, a ridiculously long list of files inside your components folder. Um, but it turns out that this is, this is really easy. It freaks people out when they see it for the first time. Like, 50 files, how am I going to find anything? But then it turns out it's really easy to find your design components. If you're a new person on the project, all they have to do is like inspect the actual thing that they're trying to alter. Inspect the DOM. Look, there's a class right there you know, on that component. And look, there's a file name with the exact same name of the CSS class. Right? So it turns out to be really easy to organize this, really easy to find things for new people. So I, I highly recommend not trying to build subfolders inside your components because it actually makes it harder to find things. Um, now, I know a bunch of you were like, wait a second, so, so you mean I need to alter my HTML to add in all of these new CSS class names? You, you do realize that we're all using Drupal, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, sometimes it can be completely crazy. You cannot like alter some you're, you're trying to get down into some template. You don't even know what it's named. Uh, and you just cannot figure out how to, to alter that bit of markup. And you know, I've been doing Drupal for 10 years, and I can't find all this stuff. But the good news is that with SAS, um, we have a way around that. With the fugly selector hack. Um, the fugly selector hack, uh, I didn't actually name it after Morton, but I like to show Morton's face when I talk about it. <laughs> Um, what I do is I will, in my SAS, I will write a selector that's based on the DOM that I was not able to change because Drupal sucks. Right? Drupal sucks, I couldn't change this DOM. Um, and then inside there, I will, add, I will extend into the class name I wish I could have used in the DOM. Right? So you know, earlier inside this SAS file, I will define the component as I wish I could have. Um, using this uh, silent selector here, feature underscore title dash link. You know, I, I wanted to put that as the class name, but I couldn't get into the damn a link because Drupal. So I'll write it this way. And it turns out this this it does make your actual CSS selector more have more specificity, but it turns out it. It's never actually a problem. I've never encountered a problem from doing it this way because you're still thinking about your design components in this repeatable way and also completely independent way. Each of your design components are independent, so you end up not without any bleeding anyway. So 
this locked it in the DOM, you know, just, it doesn't turn out to be that big of a problem usually. I mean, obviously don't use dot views space A, that would be bad, but you know, use something a little bit more specific than that. Um, but this is a great way to actually get Drupal to spit out all of our components in CSS. Um, that's basically it as far as design components go, so let's, let's start looking at automated style guides. Um, I looked at a bunch of different automated style guides and the first one that I actually got to work um, was KSS node. So this is one that I prefer. Um, and it had a couple bugs, uh, in, but because I really liked it, I actually became a maintainer of this um, as of July. So now, um, if there are bugs in this, you can yell at me. And everybody knows me, hi, say hi John. Yeah, okay, now you can, you officially know me, you can yell at me about this. Um, oh, and this is where the slide I didn't finish. So let's jump over to the last slide, which is in OmniGraffle. Oh, right, it's in front of me here. <laughs> if I can just figure out how to hide the stencils, I think. This, there we go, okay. Okay. So this is our basic workflow of, of any automated style guide system, right? So down here we have our application, in this case Drupal, um, we have our SAS files, um, HTML templates, you know, Twig, whatever, mustache, doesn't matter. Um, and what we would like to do is we, we have, you know, SAS is, is parsing the SCSS files and generating CSS files. Um, and we would also like our application to look, take our, our real templates and, and dump each design component into a separate file, just like a, a, a code snippet of HTML that our design component is going to apply to. Um, and then we're gonna have KSS, in this case, our automated style guide generator, suck in the source code of our SAS, in this case, and these HTML snippets. So it's using the real SAS, the real code, right? Um, and the real markup, um, and it's important that the style guide generator use the real code when it's building the style guide because that's the only way you can ensure that this style guide will stay up to date. I've been using style guides for like 10 years and for nine years and 10 months, they've completely sucked. <laughs> because what happens in reality, of course, is that it's, it's a waterfall thing, right? So while the designer does all the work, he does some, he does this beautiful style guide um, but of course, there was last minute changes in, in like last two weeks of his part of the process and then, you know, he had to change a whole bunch of stuff and he forgot to, or he didn't have a chance, he didn't have time to update the style guide. So I get a brand new style guide, it is already out of date. And then I start implementing stuff and it goes, goes off the rails immediately. So style guides become way more useful if you're actually automatically generating it from the real code because the style guide is guaranteed to be up to date. Um, so, so in this case here, um, so KSS is, is looking at our source code, the SAS, um, and these HTML snippets, and builds an entire static set of HTML files that are, is our style guide. Um, so it's got the real markup inside it. It has the documentation that it parsed out of the SAS file. Um, and then it's gonna hot link in the real CSS that Drupal is using in this case. So like our theme is spitting out a CSS file, and it's gonna use that CSS file in the theme. You should also like add you know, a link tag into your style guide that points at that very same CSS. Now, <clears throat> now KSS, um, right now it, it doesn't do this little bit where it sucks in HTML snippets. Um, and the, the quick hack that we, that we did, um, that the previous maintainer did, which is brilliant hack for, for a temporary workaround, is that basically you you um, you take a little HTML snippet and you stick it into the SAS file. So inside your sort of code comments about your SAS, you have a little HTML snippet. It works as a hack 
you know, I'm envisioning basically there's going to be some sort of Drupal module that will you can configure and say, okay, these are my design components that I've configured in, in Drupal, um, and they're using whatever theme hooks, and it's going to spit out each of those files, and then KSS will be able to read all of those individual files, pull in, parse the, the SAS files. The SAS files will say, hey, this design component is that HTML snippet. So it'll point at it inside the docs. Um, it'll do, just do it that way. That'll be, that's what it's going to do. It's not quite there, but it's, it's close enough that you can use it now, right? So we're, we're iterating, right? This is agile development. This is good enough to release, so we released it. Um, so let's do, let's do a demo. Okay, so first I should show you what the actual, um, if you go to the KSS node website, you'll have instructions for how to set it up. It's a regular Node.JSS, so there's like a, uh, a package.json file for there. Um, that's what that looks like. Uh, but the instructions are on the website, and if they suck, yell at me. <laughs> um, and let's look at, oh wait, I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. Let's look at, no, not that one. This one. Um, this is a ridiculously long HTML snippet, which is why I want it to be in a separate file. Um, but basically, so here, oh, I should make this bigger, shouldn't I? Is that good? Can you see in the back? Okay. Maybe, no, that's too big. 18. Okay. So here is, um, down here is our regular, you know, SAS rule set. I um, mean, we've just documented, you know, this, this footer menu in this case here. Here's, here's our, our base class footer, and then of course we have a wrapper, so it's footer menu wrapper. Um, and then this is the documentation. Basically we just, we give, we've defined what the name is. Um, we can also have a, you know, brief description, the menu that is in the footer. This is a horrible documentation. Don't ever write anything like that. Um, that's why it's not in there right now. But you can write in several paragraphs wh whatever you want about this design component right here. And then we have the markup snippet, which is, in this case, really long. Um, but this is uh, then going to be spit out on the style guide. And then the last thing here is we um, specify where in the style guide we want this to be stuck into, right? Um, and all we need to do to generate the style guide is, come on mouse, there we go. Um, in this case, I have a uh, gulp task, uh, which runs the KSS node command line utility. So I type gulp style guide because that's way easier than the um, KSS node really long thing with all the different flags on it. And it's gone through and read all of these, it's parsed all of these SAS files and generated all of these HTML files and it took it 499 milliseconds, right? Um, let's look in the gulp file real fast just so you can see, oh, just so you can see the actual KSS node command, which is right here. So um, this is some JavaScript uh, in order to run the KSS node thing, but it's basically just KSS node. Um, you point at the directory where your SAS is. Um, you point at the destination where you want the style guide to be spit out to. Um, and then this dash dash template here, this is basically saying, um, I would like to use a custom theme for my style guide um, because to be honest, the, the default theme that comes with KSS node sucks. Um, I don't even use it. Um, that's another open issue. Uh, but you just point out your custom theme, and it uses that theme to generate all your styles. Um, and let's go and look at one of them, shall we? This is the uh, very first one that I ever did for uh, MSNBC. Um, it's, it's an internal style guide, so you can't get to it um, from, from any website. Um, and you can see here that um, just parsing SAS files, it's generated all these HTML files, um, including like a list of all of our SAS variables, um, what our font faces look like, what those font variables look like, font sizes. Um, I, this was a team effort, so some of this is 
awful, but not necessarily my fault or even their faults. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, but one of the nice things about a style guide like this is it ex because we implemented this style guide right at the very, very end of the project. Um, and it exposed a lot of things that we had did, done wrong and hadn't realized until it was sort of right in our face here. We had a variable that was like, you know, green links, except that it was red, right? <laughs> um, so style guide is, is, is really, really nice because it allows you to visualize the actual component as you build it. Because as you write the CSS, you also write the style guide snippet. And we, um, you know, if we're using gulp or grunt, you're going to have like a watch command, right? So you run gulp watch, um, and it generates the KSS. And then anytime you modify any of your SAS files, it's going to automatically regenerate the CSS using SAS, and it's going to automatically regenerate the style guide. So you just run that command um, using grunt or gulp or whatever task runner you want. Starts auto generating all this stuff. Um, what are some other good ones in here? So, all of these, this this entire website, you know, has all of these different design components that are completely documented here. And the way this works in an agile development is, you know, when you start, right, your style guide is completely blank. You won't have anything. So you have the first feature. I'm like, okay. So I'm going to get a designer front-end developer, back-end developer, we're all on the team here, we're winging our first feature, we're going to figure out what that feature looks like, how it should work, the UX of all that stuff, implement that, um, and then you know the, the front-end developer is going to code that into CSS, and it's going to automatically generate into our style guide, so now our style guide has one thing on it, and then we go to the next feature. And the next feature, we look at it and like, can we reuse anything from the, the style guide? So we look at the style guide, try to find out if there's anything that we can reuse, if there is, great, you just reapply that de old design to the new feature, and you just keep going, iterating that way over it. And this, this also works on projects that have, have started out in a waterfall way. You can apply this at any time and, and just work from, from where you are day one, or you know the new day one, right? and do it this way. And you'll still get a huge benefit out of this. Um, I, I would like to leave a, a bunch of time for questions. So. Um, we should go back to the slides, and here we go. So on Friday, we're going to have a Drupal 8 sprint. Um, as I told you, the, these naming conventions are part of Drupal 8, um, and uh, we're trying to get these design component ideas into our CSS. Um, we have it in a couple places. Um, we need to apply it a lot more places. Um, and uh, the, the, the seven style guide is amazing. If you haven't seen it, uh, Lewis and, and a bunch of people worked on it. Um, it is not auto-generated right now, right? Uh, yet. Not yet. Friday, right? And they went to work on it on Friday. So <laughs> you can actually sort of get involved in Drupal 8 core, helping to make the seven style guide auto-generated from the source files. OK? Um, so thank you. And, and, and please, I'm sure you have lots of questions. Please um, go ahead and line up. But if you're over in the corner, I'll take your question. Go, you can just say your question right there. So the style guide module was written by Ken Rickard. Uh, when I worked at Palantir, he was a coworker of mine. Um, and it, it doesn't do the stuff that I need right now yet. Um, I um, would like to talk to him or, or possibly um, implement you know, a feature request about uh, having a way to be able to configure what my design components are. Um, because right now, it just sort of spits out some sort of standard um, components inside the style guide. 
Um, and it would be really nice if I could configure, like, this is the thing that I need. Um, so please build the HTML markup for that, and then and then spit it out into a separate file, right? Um, and I, I, I see it as, as and and certainly it could also be the place where it builds like this entire list of all these different components, right? Um, so yes, I have considered it. It doesn't do what I want right now, so I I grab something that works right now, and am am working on it. But I, I have a feeling it might be part of the future of. Of you know my process, so. sure. Yeah, we can chat afterwards. I, I would love to chat to you about the style guide module. Go ahead. Uh, I haven't used style guides before, and it seems like a good idea. Um, how which role does these play in the daily development work? I'm sorry. Which, um, which role does do style guides play in the daily work? Oh, of the, the role. Um, the there are two things, right? So from a front end developer standpoint. <coughs> Um, I find it much easier to uh, write the actual class names, come up with the actual class names, if I can see immediately um, what that component looks like inside the style guide as I build it. So like I have my local copy of the style guide and it's auto-generating and building up the component as I actually write lines inside my CSS. It becomes way easier to write my component if I see it being built. Um, immediately. That's really, really helpful. And of course, the other part of the daily role is is basically when we come to new features, um, we should immediately, when we first look at the feature and, and sort of understand that feature, then we'll look at the style guide and decide, are there things that we could reuse? Um, sometimes there's like, oh, this thing is like 90% of the way there. Well, now we sort of discovered that if we tweak it a little bit, that can be a new uh, new variation of it. We can add a modifier to it and make it slightly so m better for this new feature, right? So that's how it's used in, in daily use. Okay, so this also allows to um, write the CSS or the CSS before you actually build a website. That's true. Yes. So um, this is another great thing that we found out is that we, because we have you know front end developers, and back end developers, sort of working on this single feature, um, we've we've now decoupled slightly the the requirement that the back end developer does his stuff first, um, and then the front end developer does you know her stuff next, right? So you you've decoupled that so that the front end developer can build the style guide first at the same or at the same time as the back end developer is working, and then you integrate it at the end. Yeah, that's really handy too. Uh -huh. and yeah, often you get from the client, you get some kind of material where you don't know, is this just for this page or should this be sidewide? And probably the style guide will help with that. To, to you send the style guide back to the client and ask, look at this, should this be reused or should it not be reused? Yeah, is this that's, how it works? that's another thing that like, especially, um, y yes, that's absolutely, you can, the style guide is a great focusing tool for the designer as well, is because by looking at the style guide as it exists right now, they can go, oh, I don't need to completely resolve this problem. I can reuse one of my, you know, solutions that are already in the style guide, right? I mean, and sometimes if you have, you know, you have a, a, um, a client who's providing you the design sort of in waterfall fashion, you can do the same thing, right? He's like, hey, there's this thing that we already implemented that's like 95% the same way. Do you really want to pay me X dollars you know, or euros to build this whole new thing because it's slightly different in the design? Can I just save you some money and reuse this style? Right. Uh -huh. uh, another question, uh, what role does Drupal modules and Drupal themes play? So what part of the components go in a theme and what part go in a module? I like to do stuff, put in stuff in a module, but then if you decide I want a different alternative theme where everything looks different, then, mm -hmm. then maybe it's better to put it in the theme. So. Yeah, so you, I, I'm a front-end developer, so I'm, I'm you know, a themer. So I put stuff in, in the themes. Um, I feel that most of the design components, they're, they're design solutions, so they, um, but, but they have markup with them really too. So it's a combination of the markup and the CSS together, um, and they seem to fit more naturally in, in themes to me. Yeah, but then you make these things as a views plugin or as a formatter, and that's module code. So well, the module will depend on uh, the availability of some uh, CSS components then. Yeah, I mean. Which, uh, then the CSS components might be in the, in the theme, so then the module depends on the theme. It could be a bit tricky. Right. Yeah, so I'm not too worried about that. I mean, yeah, I write some, some views plugins or some, uh, uh, some panels plugins a lot of times, and those, those will be inside modules. Um, so the template's over there, um, and the CSS is over here. That's that's a real problem as far as Drupal's architecture, because it has this artificial separation between modules and themes. What we really need for um, you know the 
the next Drupal core is basically an idea of like a component library where it bundles every component has markup and CSS with it, right? That's what I would like to see. And then it gets rid of this sort of artificial, where do I put it, the modular theme? Okay. That question goes away. <laughs> question here? So the question is, if you have a, 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 a layout system that you, you, you're you just using, right, does that go? Mm-hmm. Right. So um, that's one of the things about Smacks that you could definitely argue about is that, well, do you really need to put layouts in a separate categorization from from components, because you could think about layouts as being a very, you know, very specific component that just does major shifts of your uh, pieces on the page and no other styling, right? That could be a type of component. Um, so if you want to think about them that way, you know, go for it. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, uh, Pixel Whip, it, did you give your session on layouts already? Yeah, so, so there's going to be an excellent session that's going to, the video for it is going to show up He's, where he talks about uh, CSS layouts and stuff. So uh, look for that too. So you, another question? Go for it. Yeah. Right. So the, the question is, is that you know sometimes you well often your components will be using variables, and of course the variables are going to be said you're like your variables partial and stuff. So then there's a dependency between the components and those variable names. Um, that's sort of a common problem in SAS as well. Um, and uh, I, I would love to see some some better solutions than than basically the the components can can define. I mean the best way right now that I know of is basically have the component define the default version of the variables, you know, like so it specifies the variable name, um, colon, and then the actual value, and then space, uh, exclamation point, default, semicolon, right? That's That says, if you haven't already defined it, use this, vari this value for this variable. Um, that would be the way that you could package up those components and then reason them that way, uh, but that still requires you, maybe there's some like build thing, like so some part of your like, build system goes, oh, I'm downloading, I'm grabbing this other component that I'm reusing. Um, and it's going to like yank the variables out of there, strip the word default, and then stick it inside your variables folder. Maybe that would be a way it would automate um, and remove the sort of hard dependency on variable names inside components. The only questions is it's it's actually it's been one hour. So thank you so much for spending your time with me.
Where do you start? You start at the top of the hour. Right at five. Okay. Yep.